So we'll now make a formal start. Thank you very much for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, a very warm welcome to our members um, who are joining this session today. This is our um, session. Um, this session is tagged as creating confidence in how people are paid. And I have the pleasure um, of hosting um, the, the series. Um, my name is Ross. You know, for those who haven't interacted with me before, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of the uh, Payroll Association. Um, as I've mentioned, this is the the, the, the second um, in the series, and there will be multiple um, to come as we track through uh, into 2024. To give you, um, again, just a bit of a, an understanding, this is really um, the focus of these sessions is about learning and elevating um, the knowledge that uh, we have um, as individuals and, and mem members around the payroll products and services that are available um, locally here in Australia. Um, today, we are delighted um, to have uh, members of the with us and their session today is going to uh, focus on showcasing uh, technology that can help organizations one navigate the complexity of, of, of payroll in Australia and um, but also um, how technology can act as an enabler um, an enabler in areas around managing legislation an enabler uh, uh, from an employer perspective but also an enabler for uh, from an Objective as well. From, um, they are called the Access Group, and the terminology on the team here, the A team, that was me, that wasn't them that asked me to say that. <laughs> uh, we have Stephen Duncan, who is uh, the head of uh, marketing for the People and Payroll Division, Anthony Bagus, who is the head of sales, and Scott Robertson, um, who will drive uh, their presentation on, on, on their site. Um, without any just a little bit of housekeeping before I pass across to Stephen because there's probably one or two questions around the session. So is the session recorded? It absolutely is. And you will see a copy of it. It will also be hosted in our digital room. So for members who haven't moved into that environment, we have a number of our partners who have content that sit within that digital room. Um, it's a nice, safe environment to create a soft desktop review from. Can you ask questions today? Absolutely. You can ask as many questions as you like. I just probably won't answer them. Um, and how do you connect with the Access Group team after this session? There'll be a slide at the very, very end that will give you direction around um, how to reach out to them and to engage in a conversation. That is the housekeeping finished. That is my introduction finish. I will now pass over to Scott, who uh, is going to take control of the screen. Excellent. Thanks, Ross, and uh, welcome team and extended team. So yeah, look, really, uh, really excited and honored to be working closely with the APA as we, we have for quite quite some time. So that's number one. And, and to speak to you directly, obviously, is, is an honor for us. Um, I'm head of marketing, so my job is to listen to our clients, listen to the market, and then feed that back through you know our materials and what we do out in market. So we'll talk about that later where you can get uh, more relevant materials to help you along your journey. So again, we mentioned this overcoming some of the modern challenges. Uh, that That's the theme for today and, and how we can turn payroll into strategic enabler as well, I think is, is gonna come out of this. So without further ado, I'll just move on to the next slide. We're gonna talk about the evolution of payroll and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Anthony Bagus to do this. Um, he's gonna really unpick you know, how we've changed the complexity, how the impact has changed for, you know, potentially you yourselves as, as payroll leaders, but also for the business and the employees as well. Then we'll look at what we could do around, you know, turning payroll into a strategic enabler. So definitely a great opportunity. And we've done some research around that, which I'll share. Then, you know, we'll look into how we can lift the level of automation and, and drive some of the digital expectations that are, that are coming, you know, obviously thick and fast, right? So employees are expecting a full digital experience from even before day one. So what Scott will do is uh, he'll take us through some of these technologies and, you know, some step changes that you 
you know, could look to uh, apply within your business. And obviously as, as access, we, we help our customers do that. So through a bit of a demo and then we will have a and a So I think as Ross mentioned, if there's any um, questions you have, please enter them into the chat or the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try to pick them up throughout the session. Uh, if they're relevant, we'll answer them on the spot or we'll leave it to the end. If we don't get to your question in particular, don't, don't stress, we'll, we'll uh, reach out and um, you know, provide you the detail on that. All right, that's me. So what I'm gonna do is just pass it over to my colleague, Anthony Bagus. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm going to apologize first up because my voice is uh, a little bit a little bit off today, but I'm going to see what I can do to get through the session and hopefully be quite audible on the other end. Um, yeah, also just extending a thanks to the APA. We've you know obviously worked with you guys for some time and it's a, an important relationship for us. Um, so really, you know, really pleased to be here today to talk to the members. Um, and, you know, we're going to go through a bit of a journey. When we sort of decided how we would approach this today, we sort of decided that just purely showing product only wasn't really you know, going to be all that beneficial, but we wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the lens and how we see the world and how we see the world of payroll as well. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. I've been in the payroll world myself for over 20 odd years now, um, you know, starting in a very large organisation now, now being a sales manager for, um, you know, in, at, at the access group and taking product to market. And when we look at, you know, the changes and when we sort of reflect on the changes that are happening in the payroll world, and I'm sure that the people on this call will be very easy to sort of, you know, understand this, these, these, what we, what we've, what uh, Stephen has, you know, referred to as step changes. And I think it's quite appropriate because when we look at sort of that, you know, the early eras of payroll, it was really quite a lot more straightforward, you know, and back in the early days, we didn't even have things like superannuation. Um, you know, the calculations were quite straightforward. The payslip regulations were very simple, you know, banking and ATO reporting. In fact, we didn't even report to the ATO until, you know, the end of the year sort of thing. Um, so, you know, back in the back in the early days and perhaps the good old days, you know, things were a lot simpler. And then we sort of take a sort of a, a phase of change of sort of in those 2000s, 2018 sort of era. And, and the dates in here, guys, it was sort of looking at them as a generic thing, they're not spot on in terms of, we're not calling out exact dates of these changes. It's just more to look at, you know, that evolution and understanding that evolution. Um, and what we see in that sort of middle era in, in the payroll world is that changes to, towards things like STP and, you know, super choice came in prior to that. And then there was things like, you know, some expectations from people about, you know, connecting with their payroll. So thinking about, you know, ESS and manager self-service and employee self-service started to become a bit more prominent. You know, amongst all of that, we started getting into probably in that later half there, we started getting into things like, you know, award changes that introduced things like salary annualization, which when we first heard about it was really even hard to grasp what exactly what, what that meant and what that impact was really going to be. Um, and then we started thinking about well awards and the awards started to become more prominent as well in that in that sort of middle era of, you know, that in, in this step changes here. Um, so there's, you know, quite a lot that sort of started taking place between that sort of 2000, 2018 era. And then even when you think back to just, you know, what, three or four years ago now from 2019, and you just think that things haven't got, you know, enough change hasn't happened. Then we go into things like, you know, we had an era where COVID-19 accelerated a lot of changes too from a digital workplace perspective. Um, STP2 decided to come about just, you know, when we sort of just dusted off after STP1. Um, and now we're sort of talking about things like Payday Super. So coming in 2026, if you haven't heard about it yet, you can Google this one. Um, but we're sort of talking about having superannuation required to be paid on the day of pay. Um, there's been domestic violence leave, you know, introduced, and we're probably going to see a whole bunch more. So what we've seen is that in, even in this short period of time, just a significant amount of change happening in that in the complexity of the role of payroll. Um, so the one thing I'll say is everyone out there doing this job, my hat's off to you because it's not an easy role these days and it certainly has changed quite a lot. And some of the things that we sort of think about, the lens that we look at as a vendor is we look at these things and we think, well, you know, how does, how does this impact the role and what does the role then mean and how does it play? And there's lots of ways in which this role changes. Um, but one of the things we've also recognised is that the way the role is actually supported, obviously, in, in a lot of cases, hasn't changed. So, you know, a lot of a lot of organisations see payroll as just payroll producing pay slips, and they're not really completely understanding the complexities that have gone into, um, you know, the the role the roles that we now play in this world. 
And one of the things we've also sort of understood, you know, and when we're looking at all of this is that, you know, even awards, we think about awards as being, you know, traditionally something that was a blue collar workplace thing or, you know, something that applied to certain industries or organisations. And in fact, what we found is that more than 70% of organisations, and I think that's the right stat, Steve. He's on mute, poor guy. Absolutely. Caught him out. Yeah, yeah. 70, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so about 70% of organisations are actually exposed to awards. And so when we start thinking about the technology and we line up technology to all of these changes and you start thinking about, well, what sort of system would somebody need in today's environment? And the answer today is very different to the answer back in, say, the early two, you know, early 2000s or in the, you know, in the 90s. And what we sort of start to think about is, well, how could you even operate in a world where you didn't have things like an award interpreter when actually 70% of organisations do have an award association now? And we sort of, not, we, don't, we haven't really worked out that actually even things like, you know, white collar industries these days are actually covered by awards. If people do long hours, they work weekends or do different things like that, you know, that, that can have implications for, you know, your payroll and what you're actually paying in a week. So we sort of, when we looked at this and we actually sort of charted it out, we go, it's actually like a significantly changed environment and it's, you know, changed sort of, you know, under our nose in a lot of ways. Um, and some of the things that amongst that, like I said, the one of the big things is, is that organisations themselves haven't made the step change in how they view these roles necessarily. Now, it might be the case in, you know, some organisations. And if you're in that kind of business, then kudos, that's great. Um, but this is sort of, you know, when we're thinking about how we take product to market and sort of products we're developing, these are the things that we're thinking about. Um, and so later in the track, we'll actually look at, well, how, did we, did, how do we then actually address those sort of items? Um, and before I change, did you want to add anything to that, Steve? No, I think you're spot on. I think, you know, I think, you know, once we hit the cloud, we just saw this, you know, massive spike and increase in technology and expectation. And I think, you know, you'll probably go through it, but the way that most companies manage it, in fact, our own customers to a certain extent was that they had to start bolting things on. They were looking for different technologies to sort of fill yeah. the gaps where needed. So, um, you know, obviously we'll explore that a little bit, but uh, it's kind of a, you know, a response to the hyper growth of technology. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I think, um, you know, COVID saw a, a massive step change in how organisations behave. Mm. We obviously all all of a sudden had to work from home and, you know, in, in some organisations that wasn't really something that was that advanced and, you know, overnight, you know, you really had to have people work, working from home because I guess in some cases, you know, if you, if you got employees sick back in those early days when we didn't really understand COVID, then, you know, it was going to yep. be a potential issue for that workplace and, you know, obviously you didn't want to end up all over the news like some organisations did. So, we yeah. so really had to adapt very quickly to those, to those changes. Um, and accelerated change like significantly. And just purely having remote workers setting up at home, allowing people then to log in, you know, where they had to work and have that flexibility to capture time in different places, you know, but, you know, obviously for employers, they wanted to make sure that people were, you know, logging in where they needed to be, but that whole environment had to be secure as well. So we've gone through a security journey to ensure that, you know, everybody's safe and secure and data is secure as well. So. Yeah. So I think it's like for us, it's good to, it's important for us to understand this because this is, I think this is how we connect to what the need is, you know, fundamentally in, in the payroll world. And I mean, there'd be lots of, you know, additional things on that, you know, would be rolled into these these areas. So I'm sure we haven't captured everything, but it's just, it gives us a bit of a lens as to look at, well, what's the role? And therefore, if we understand the role more, then we understand the role of technology that plays into this. Um, so if we just go to the next slide now. And so when we think about, you know, the evolution of payroll, that really, that first slide that we just saw really talks to, you know, more so that legislation change. Um, and, you know, we all know, we're all quite aware of, you know, those changes, that it's increasing complexity, it's increased risks, it's all these different things. You know, we see a lot of, um, you know, uh, text and data on the impact of underpayments and what that, you know, what those, what, what the issues are associated to that. So we're really quite aware of all those things. But when we sort of actually look at this a bit more and we start thinking about, well, what's also pushing the change of payroll, we actually decided that it's probably more than just legislation. It's the employer and employee changes as well. Um, and so these days we have employees that I call them the, the TikTok era, which thankfully is not my era. Um, but it's probably, you know, the kids that we have out there and the, the, the children that are, you know, probably 
um, you know, people, uh, people's kids and whatnot. But this is, you know, it's a growing era and it's a growing place. And it's going to be the era that eventually we're either hiring in our workplace or employing in these roles or, you know, having some sort of interaction within the workplace. And the TikTok era these days, you know, they are expecting things to be fully connected and digitally enabled. So, you know, when we, for a while there, in the, you know, maybe those 2000s, you know, ESS and MSS was something that was kind of an option. Like, we did, we, do we want to do that? Do we want to have, you know, online portals and whatnot? Well, I think the TikTok era and those employees that are coming up in the workplace, they really just expect this. They just think this is just normal. If they can't, if they don't, if they can't access their workplace in the palm of their hand, then you know there's something wrong with that. And so we've seen the change from employees as well. And if you look at well, what's that change? You know, how is that working from an employer perspective? Well, the thing with employers, and this, you know, to some respect, could be a generalisation, but what we know is that there's not necessarily the same understanding of the legislative change and the changing of the role. And there's not necessarily the, the understanding of the complexity and how that's changing as well. And what that means is that you don't necessarily have an employer saying, oh, I can see all these changes are happening. I can see the increased complexity and you know all these requirements that are required of you. And oh, guess what? As a result of that, let's hire another three people to help you in your job. It's not really generally speaking, the sort of, um, you know, attitude that most employers will take. And what most of them are looking for really is to have increased efficiency in those roles to meet what is the, you know, a, a role that's increasingly more complex. Um, so they're not sort of saying, well, your, your job's getting busier, so we'll, we'll you know, throw more resource at it. What they're saying is, well, you just got to, you know, meet that need. And the thing is that meeting that need probably needs to be done in a different way now. Um, and that's where we see the change in what we what people are looking for in a, in a, in a system or in a payroll package. Um, and therefore, addressing things like awards becomes important. Addressing things like onboarding becomes important. And addressing things like the employee experience becomes important because our employees are expecting those sorts of things. So we sort of see in our, in our, in our frame of mind and the way we think about things, there's probably you know, three major pillars that are impacting that evolution of payroll and what people are expecting in the world today in, 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 in the, and in the roles that we deliver. Um, yeah, the only thing I'd throw in there, probably, uh, Anthony, I think you covered most things, is that you know we, employers do want to see be seen as an employer of choice, and I think absolutely. part of that is is that journey. I'm and Scott will touch on this a bit later, but it's that it's that first journey an employee has. So you know, I know when I onboarded, you know, in my previous roles, and you know, it was, it was paper based, right? You know, you you get things in the mail and. You know, trying to work okay. out how you make copies and, you know, then you mailed it in, but you wanted to do it securely. So no one got your information. So you put it in post packs or you dropped it off at the, the actual employer, you know, it was, a, it was a mess, right? Um, that, that has to change. And that, that's that TikTok era, right? Their expectation. My son just, just onboarded with a new employer. It's, you know, it's digitally enabled. I don't think he'd expect anything, you know, less. Anything different, that's right. Excellent. So, yeah, absolutely. I think, the, I think the COVID, and we could talk about this for hours, as you know, um, yeah. Steve, and I'll save the listeners my, my talking for too long. But, you know, I think the COVID era sort of impacted that too. Oh, 100%. For, yeah. for quite some time there, we had real scarcity of employees. So becoming an employer choice and looking at this role and saying, well, how do you how do you do that? And, is it, and I mean, today we're sort of focusing more on the payroll world, but obviously this, league, league, uh, you know, goes into the role in, in HR as well. And many of the people on this call today are probably in those dual roles, you know, where they're doing a bit of payroll, but HR. And so having, you know, being an employed choice does does sort of lean back to, well, from a technology perspective, how do you enable that? So, yeah. All right. So um, move on to the next slide. What we've, thank you. What we did is instead of sort of believing our own, you know, talk track, we, we went out to market and, we did some research with a, um, a third party who reached out to over uh, 200, 250 odd um, senior decision makers uh, across Australia. Uh, this was last month and it, across finance, HR, payroll operations, the whole gamut. And we just asked them some of these questions. So if they're using payroll, you know, uh, basically as an administrative tool at the moment, like it's primarily for paying people, managing things like those awards and so forth, you know, what was the, you know, how were they seeing the changing landscape impacting them with, with all these sort of hyper changes that are happening? And, and the results are quite staggering that, you know, one third admitted to not being able to deliver their pay run on time at any one time, right? So it's quite a large statistic. Uh, another one in there was 50% of organizations, you know, struggle to make informed decisions. Things like, you know, workforce planning, you know, labor costs. So they're just 
looking at labor costs after the fact and then trying to backtrack how they how they fill that gap in the budget um, and then hiring you know high, proper hiring decisions as well uh, and then 51 percent said they had poor MPS scores and primarily what we were seeing is that they were paying people and they're getting you know and they had some of the ESS functionality but people just didn't feel connected or if they weren't being paid you know correctly they just didn't have a quick avenue to address it you know there was just that communication you know disconnect i think within the business was was driving a lot of that and they weren't being followed up and asking sort of simple questions in in their environment do they have enough to work you know enough tools and, and those sort of things. And then interestingly enough, this actually came from the, the APA themselves. I saw this in the, in the recent benchmark report that uh, you know payroll professionals is expected to change their jobs in the next 12 months. And speaking to Tracy and a few of the people, um, you know, what you're hearing is that they're just frustrated. They're just frustrated that they can't be more efficient with what, you know, the tools that they have. So if they're not happy, then you know, potentially they'll be looking for other organizations that help to provide them with that support. Um, so again, it's important for us as, as suppliers in the industry that we listen uh, to this group and make sure that, you know, we're, we're able to help them with their, their roles and, and they're satisfied with um, what they're able to achieve. So that, that was some of the results that we found. And if we just go to the next slide, um, what we then did is we just flipped that and we said, well, what if you could change, you know, that narrative and the dial and what about looking at the people that have already gone on the journey to make payroll or view payroll as a strategic enabler so i think that's the key is if you view it beyond the admin function so getting pay accurate timely you know um, and compliant is 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 the huge tick in the box so that's what everybody wants to do right but what about if you were actually able to you know go that step further and what would you achieve if you viewed it that way and use the technology again um, to its you know to its most uh, benefit and what would you get out of it so if we go to the next slide then what we'll see is is what that uh, group um, in, in that uh, in, in our research uh, responded with. So the first headline is almost in every question we asked, right, the dozens and dozens of questions we asked, organizations said if they view payroll as a strategic enabler, they were getting between two to four times more likely to achieve better outcomes compared to those that didn't view it as being strategic. So that's, that's massive in itself. And that comes through a number of different areas. So I've just you know, put four in here, but there's more. And I, I was going to say, um, I'll mention at the end, if anybody's interested in this report, as we begin to publish it, I'll get you just to put a note in the, in the chat and we'll absolutely send that out to you once it's complete. But 49%, so the, they had the ability now to make informed and timely decisions. And that's great. So they, they actually felt comfortable uh, that they had the data they needed to make those decisions. You know, better visibility over labor costs increased, you know, by 38% alone, just by you know, viewing it and having the data that they needed. Um, and 65% felt more confident that their pay slips were accurate and compliant. Like they knew, they just felt that they, they you know, that once what was going out, that they could back that up with, with, with the data. Things like pay slips, you know, sorry, things like um, the timesheets um, were accurate, right? A viewed against the awards were accurate because the systems were interlocked. So they knew that there was no manual overheads that they had to fill the gap on. They, they knew the data was correct. Um, and then driving the MPS scores was massive, a, a massive 50% got, got better results out of the MPS scores, right? And for me, that was key because if, if an employ, if employee is happy, right, or, or if they feel they're productive and happy with their, their organization they work with, they're more likely to stay, be stickier, right? And what we're seeing is a generation, unfortunately, where, you know, turnover is high. So attrition is high. Um, we talk about it as, you know, quiet quitting. You don't know people are leaving. Talk about the great resignation, right? But stemming the tide of that is just making sure that people feel connected. So again, we'll show a little bit of that tech later in how we manage that. But I think it's important to make sure that, you know, we just don't take the employees, you know, um, we, we listen to them and we have, we have the capabilities uh, to service them in the way that they'd expect it, not just, you know, again, just providing them uh, an output in, in, in their payroll. Thanks for that. So if we go on to the next one, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, uh, 
I'll pass it back to Anthony. So this is the point where we're going to show you some case studies for change. So we've sort of built out that structure in the, you know, that journey that we, 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 we've reached, um, some of the challenges um, that, you know, we've seen from that, some of the opportunities that we, we see for some step change. And now we just want to take you through a couple of case studies. So Anthony will go back through those examples of, you know, legislation, employee, employer, and we'll just show you uh, where some opportunities where we can we can assist in in, in the technology. Yeah, thanks, so Stephen. So, you know, ob obviously, some of these things will be intertwined. So, employer legislation and, and employee expectations, right? But from a you know from an onboarding from an employer perspective, things like you know digital onboarding it, it sets a particular tone. It shows a particular level of enablement. But also from a you know perspective of efficiency, obviously, if we're distributing things like contracts electronically, that creates you know pure efficiency because it's all done digitally as opposed to, you know, good old Australia Post, nothing wrong with them though. Um, but also, you know, it enhances things like um, quality of data if the employee if the employee, employee themselves is actually, you know, populating their information. Um, the tech these days has, you know, great um, ability to test data on the fly. So when you when an employee is actually in, inputting data, things like TFNs can be, you know, checked and verified and PSPT tells them what not. So really this is, um, having a digital type of onboarding creates a, a pretty obvious step change in how um, you know how that process is now uh, addressed and can be addressed in an organisation you know through that kind of approach. Um, so with that, what we might do is just have a very quick um, quick view of what that would look like in one of our products. Awesome, thanks, Anthony. Is that coming through clear for everyone? Yeah, you good, mate. Fantastic. Sounds great. Yeah, so let's have a look at something like Definitive that has that, that onboarding journey and that true cloud experience. So this is something that I went through personally myself as I joined the company. And it's it's really easy to go through and navigate because first off, it kicks you off with an overview of everything that you need. Um, so a good overview of all the information and it's all on the cloud. So it's really easy to go through from your laptop or as we go through as well, we can also go through from our mobile. So employee documents, all the information that you need to send out to the employee, no longer an Oz post and a large pay packet or you know that large document and things getting lost in the mail, just have it all on the web. So we're going through and having a read on our employment contract, we're going through and initialing and sign this as well. So when we're happy, we can sign all of that away inside the product there. Like I said, this could be completed on the web or through your mobile device as well. So if it's easier, if you know new starters are on the run, Let's start the relationship off on the right foot and enable them to do that document signing wherever they see fit that's easiest for them. So when we're going back and forth, you can jump back from the web, from your laptop, from your phone, whatever's easiest for your new starter, because this really is the start of their first touch points with you and your company. So make it easy, start that relationship off on the right journey, on the right foot. So things like compliances, let's capture all the information that we need, make sure it's compliant, capture the expiry dates, and again, is this via the web and we're uploading these documents via the just our uh, laptop here as well so let's grab that first aid certificate or when we're jumping through on a mobile device if i just bring that across here as well are we just taking a quick snapshot on our camera do i have my first aid certificate in front of me do i have my license there that i need just take a quick photo or if it's on the meter on your phone it's a lot easier to do it so you've got the freedom to do and navigate this process how you see fit which enables it and kicks off that relationship on the right foot Importantly, when we're capturing these expiry dates, things do expire. Obviously, when our employees stay with us for a long period of time, their documents will need to keep up to date. Driver's license, first aid requirements, or whatever documents are required to work their role. When we're capturing that expiry date, we're sending out automatic reminders, not just to the employee to help them stay on top of their duties, but also to the managers, making sure everyone has right and full visibility for all of our compliance certificates. Jumping through to the next step, here's our TFN. Really easy for the employee to just punch it in. But importantly as well, we're validating that as a correct TFN. So when it comes through to Jan and Marge through to payroll, we're making sure that this information is correct up front, not having to do a lot of manual processes off the back of this. We're doing all of our tax declarations in here as well. And then of course, handling the STP2 compliances. Superannuation as well. So you see all this journey across the top, a lot of the functionality we can just capture up front. For super, we can also set default super funds. Here's just an example. It differs for every single company that I've got the privilege of demoing to, or I can also choose my own super fund. So I'm personally with REST Super. So I can search by the name, the USI or the ABN. And this can also work with self-managed super funds as well. So it's really easy for all of your different employees that are starting that journey with you. They can just quickly find the correct super fund 
selecting their fund and then inputting in their membership number. Same thing with bank accounts. You'll hear the story bang on throughout this journey. We're always doing this validation piece, making sure it's a valid brand and branch. And of course they can just input in their account numbers, names and references, et cetera. But you see this, this piece as we're going through all of the different areas throughout the onboarding journey. All of this is self-validating, selecting all the information, pre-formatting a lot of the data like the home address fields, all of the um, formats correct, pin drop down, really nice and easy for all of our new onboards. So I'll stop there. I know the, there are a few more fields, but of course, in the purpose of time, let's, let's just cap that off. But I hope that sets the scene of what an onboarding journey could look like. It's true cloud, and it makes it really easy for the employees to capture all the re relevant information, which off the back of that makes it really simple for the managers to then validate the compliance certificates and reduces all of the manual load for all of our payroll officers in the room too. And with that, I'll hand it back over to the team. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I think we need to go slide forward. There we go. Um, yeah, and look, you know, like I said, there's there's some uh, the evolution of payroll looking at it from an employee lens, you know, um, you know, the workplace in hand, the confidence and visibility in the connected system. So at this point, what we really, what the lens that we're thinking about in those, you know, that those, those three areas of change that we're seeing is that employees, as I said, these days, they really are expecting to be able to be connected to their workplace. Um, and and they, they want it in their hand, like everything else. They've got their, uh, you know, Uber Eats apps in there. They've got everything can be basically accessed from a mobile phone these days. And so why shouldn't your relationship with your employer be, you know, something you can access in your in the palm of your hand as well? And so that's where, you know, the, the change that having something like an ESS is not really even an option these days. It's almost a mandatory um, and it's certainly what we're seeing in you know in the the customers and the employee the employers that we're working with. Um, and so you know if we're thinking about that evolutionary change, it's you know basically saying that this this is this is becoming basically minimum standard. And so with that, what we'll do is we'll have a quick look at well, how do we address that from a product perspective? And so I'll hand back to Scott. Easy. I'll just drag across my phone. Hopefully I can get that to overlap. Awesome. So again, throughout a lot of the demonstrations that I've done and working with a lot of our customers, every business and industry has a lot of different requirements when it comes to capturing time and attendance, but you know, leave how they're communicating with staff. So again, the TikTok generation, like Anthony said, and all the, also those that uh, I'd say late tech adopters, um, there's also going to be always a few of those in the company. You want to make sure that the app is really easy to use and function and also allows employees to capture all the relevant information. So of course we we offer the kiosk style. So you've got your your fobs, your tags, whatever. So employees can't give an excuse that they've forgotten theirs. But why not just push that and enable the employee to clock in, clock out using the the device that they're most familiar with, right? Their mobile phone. So with that, let's just quickly enter in a time clock. You see, I've got a timesheet at the moment. It is geolocation. So as I input that event down the bottom left, start my shift. Has that drop down? You see, I'm in the, the lovely Melbourne and South Bank area, and I've got that location. But why not as well? And of course, in this scenario, it allows them to clock out anywhere in Australia. But why not geofence it? You know, we're making sure they're actually clocking in on site. So they're not in the car park waiting outside. Or if you're in an office building, you know, this cafe or bar downstairs, you're actually making sure they're on the right floor, not having a beer in the lobby. Right. So it's that kind of functionality that you allows the freedom to clock in and out, whether it's a kiosk, whether it's a mobile phone and using that geofencing as well. You're allowing employees to capture all the relevant information and whether they're going throughout their shift and entering breaks or well, they're changing duty as well. So if I'm you know, a, a maths teacher or something like that, and then I'm also changing duties and I'm going to be my sports coach in the afternoon, basketball coach, I can actually do that as well and capture all the relevant information, particularly all these allowances, which will flow into a bit of a sneak peek down the line as well, how this flows through to award interpretation and payroll. Capture all the relevant information that might tie to allowances, that might tie to different role changes, different pay rates, et cetera. I've got the relevant information available here that I can input that, have that automatically flow through to payroll. Not only does it do you know, pay adjustments, rate pay, um, changes, et cetera, if I'm on a different salary or there's, there's on-cost splits that are tied to the role, those costing splits as I change duties will also impact all on-costs as well that can automatically flow through to GL. So that's what it looks like. It's really seamless from the employee to get it right. Through our exceptions and rounding rules and grace periods, the managers are only concerned with the exceptions, right? Let's reduce the noise for our managers to make sure that they can stay on top of their day-to-day -day duties and not get bogged down with just approving timesheets. So that's a, little, a way that we can you know, do real-time time clocking, but also how do we make sure that the employee is staying connected? Let's jump into announcements. 
right? How can we make sure that we're staying up to date with our employees? They're feeling involved in the company. We're pushing out your mental health reminders, which is quite topical at the moment. Uh, with policy changes, et cetera, if we've got attachments, they can even sign this away in the app or even just something as simple as there's a footy tipping on the ladder. You know, you don't want to make sure you're last on the ladder. Quite relevant, of course, with the, the few final series that were just recently. So I hope that explains, you know, a little bit about what it could look like. And this is just an example with Definitive. It's all in the one app. Of course, you've got all the other different functionality that you see here. It's just a lot easier, reduces the manual workload for our team and makes sure that we get it right up front. With that, I'll hand it back over to you, Anthony. Yeah, cool. Thanks, um, Scott. And that's a great, very mini overview. I think the cool thing to sort of point out there too is that the Definitive application is completely one uh, one product. It's a single platform. There's no extensions or add-ons or integrations. It's a single, it's a single, yeah, single monolith, monolithic thing. I sort of call it sometimes. And that is that when you go from onboarding, that onboarding uh, experience becomes the employee's record, and the employee's record is what they're interacting with on the app. Um, for those people who don't submit timesheets, that's okay. That doesn't necessarily have to be done that way. You know, the ESS app would therefore be used for things like pay slips and, um, you know, applying for leave and announcements and, you know, banking, etc. So, you, can, you know, the, the use of the product would be different for different people, depending on industry. Um, so looking at legislation, so probably a good um, way to sort of transfer into this topic, you know, the other sort of pillar for change is that, as we sort of mentioned before, that 70% of the workforce these days are covered by awards. And that the, that thinking is something that we've, we all have to sort of change a little bit, I suppose, and I think has changed. Um, and we sort of typically, you know, when I was first selling software you know, many years ago now, um, we would look at, you know, white collar firms like accounting firms or law firms. And it was really quite, when you sort of looked at those payrolls back then, they used to be really quite straightforward. It was a 38 hour week and there was four weeks leave and two weeks personal leave. And those kind of things was was kind of the, the summary of those requirements in those businesses. But the thing now is that with things like annualization and with things, all the different changes and the way in which awards now behave, I mean, if someone in a in one of those businesses works overtime, well, that potentially could be additional hours if they work weekend. Or and in the old days, we generally didn't pay those things. So, and now the question is, well, you know, if you think that you're not covered by awards, well, maybe think again because you probably are. Um, and that's the that's the that's the tricky thing about the environment these days. So, um, and you know, the system that we might have bought back in a white collar business back you know 15 years ago may not be the same thing that you buy today in that same environment. Um, so it's you know increasing in terms of the challenges and how you address the payroll needs in those different organisations, um, and and really you know what we need to do is make sure we are managing the, the the changing pay conditions and and the things that are now topical and now the way in which we need to address those things. So legislation really has pushed us in a in a you know really different direction and has um, escalated how we need to approach uh, you know addressing that payroll need so what we might do is just look at well even in you know even when we're thinking about what is would be a traditionally a simple payroll may not necessarily be that and what we can do now is actually have award interpreters in place so that should something of an outlier occur what we can now do is actually automate the treatment of that payment through a system that has inbuilt in it an award interpreter um, and that's the beautiful thing about definitive so we might just switch over and just look at um, the benefits of having an award interpreter, even in a basic payroll. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, like you say, with all the different complexities, payroll can be extremely complex when we're looking about handle all of those different overtime rules, the penalty rates changing from job, there's different rates and allowances, etc. But let's have an award interpretation that's not coding. You don't have to be a computer scientist to figure this out. It's all in plain text. So it's easy to maintain going forward. Of course, knowing there's an enablement team and support team that can help you with this ongoing. So don't worry, a, a, a common question I get asked with, you know, demoing this is, you know, do we have to build this out? Absolutely not. Definitive's team builds this out for you and then enables you to maintain it going forward. So as we're going through, let's look at some of the complexities. Like Anthony said, are there different shift type rules that encompass, you know, the day type, public holiday or not? The classic example is what if there's a, a public holiday on the Friday, someone works over midnight and encompasses penalty rates Monday, um, Saturday morning. You know, how do we handle that shift? Is it one shift matching it on the Friday, splitting it in two, treating it as separate? That type of complexity we can handle with a simple if then almost Excel style rule logic. All, right, all of that flowing down, let the system handle it for you. Let Take the complexity away from the team and make a predictable and auditable outcome for your team. So when we're bringing in that timesheet because it is the all in one, this is how it deduces and flows down through this waterfall style if rules. And then we're just adding the pay outcomes down the bottom. Right, so this, let the system do the heavy lifting, let it be the enabler for your team. 
And then of course, what definitive it is date driven. So you see up the top, commence and a C state. What does that mean for us? Well, the reality is there's always going to be negotiated EBA rates. And you know, we know that those can be prolonged and the effective date may actually be weeks, if not months in the past. Or Fair Work might only give us a week's notice that they've updated an allowance and we need to go through and do that. So what we can do is actually set an effective commencement date, even if that's in the past, right? Definitive being an all-in-one, we have the timesheets, we've got all the pay data. If we create a back date, Definitive will fix what got us in trouble, reverse out all these payments and bring them back through all on the higher rate. All right, so let's just have a quick behind the scenes of what that would look like. Jumping through now, we're now inside a pay run. So we're looking at the outputs, not only just for a specific employee, but this could impact all of our staff that are underpinned by that particular award um, calculator. So we're looking really into the weeds, a bit behind the scenes. And this is really the granular level of a lot of the demonstrations, but really specifically, let's jump into the back pay tab of Molly. And here we can see that she's had an award adjustment or a pay condition adjustment in the past. Why? Let's focus on just the ordinary time in this example. Let's go through and see for the Fridays. She's had her old rate adjustment to pull it out. So we're reversing out all the 7.6 hours worked on the $48 an hour and bring them all back in on the new rate. And we'll see on the pay policy side, she was at our level 11 rate. Now she's moved to a level 12. We see the award policy that was used, the award source. So for all of those if then rules, we've got that numerical value tracing back. So we know exactly where to look back and how it was calculated. If we ever need to do, go through and understand why, we've got that traceability there for us. So I know this can be quite overwhelming, but it's good to know that when you have a system that is all in one, you've got the onboarding, you're getting it right with the compliances, you're sending out right notifications, you've got the timesheets there for you, you're getting it right up front. Then you're letting the system do the heavy lifting with the awards. This is the type of output that you can create. Something that was you know, a two week back pay for Molly might take hours. If you've got a manual process, make the change in definitive and it can happen automatically. So that's really the power of having it all in one. So with that being said, I'll hand that back over to you, Anthony and Stephen. Awesome. Yeah, look, all I, all I want to add here, and, and I think we're, we're almost at time. I'm just looking to see if there was any questions coming through. Um, and I think we've answered a few. Uh, so hopefully you've got those answers. I'm just checking to see if there's anything else. There's a question here about annualized salaries. So will we take the annualized salary conditions against the timesheets entered by the employees? So we do have a way to manage that, don't we, Scotty? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's the point of being able to capture all of that data so that we can do that you know, concise reporting and do those comparisons for us as well. So it's just about making sure we're capturing all the true data worked so that we're able to run those reports and do those comparisons. Um, there's a question, it's a good question actually, around super stapling for uh, during the onboarding process. That's a really good question. Yeah, awesome. Sorry, Anthony, I think you brought the pipe up there. No, no, you're right. It's um, Well, it's an interesting thing, right? So it, it, the super stapling allows um, an employee who has an existing fund to then have that fund obviously come with them to the new employer. It's a bit odd because it's, it's, it sounds and feels a little bit like just choice of fund in a lot of ways. From a... And, and, and you know, I have read about this and, you know, looked at it, but I, and I may not be able to answer this 100% today, but certainly from that onboarding perspective, the employee is given the opportunity to suggest which fund that there is they're going to, and they can just, um, you know, dictate that in there. Um, so they can actually just, you know, notify in that onboarding process which fund it is that they want to get, uh, be attached to in, you know, going forward. That may not answer the question 100%, but I'm happy to take that off, offline with, I think, Sarah, I think it is. Yeah, I need to just double so, check, yeah. I think there's one as well that just come through. Can we have more than one award interpreted at the same yeah. time? We have three awards that we work with. So absolutely, yes. Um, yeah. you know, all of our customers have multiple different awards um, and EBAs and you know, common law contracts, yeah. et cetera. And not only that, you can also have employees that work across multiple different awards. So that's quite common as well, particularly for different um, industries or certain industries. You might have one under a particular EBA, but then also depending on the role that they work, get paid through a different award. And that's something that when we're taking the timesheet, Pinning that against the awards, you can actually cater to that, even if they're in the same pay um, pay cycle. Yeah, I can't remember if you mentioned. And apologies, uh, Scotty, I just got a break in the in the audio earlier, but 
we do we we manage a lot of schools uh definitely in private schools and we see that educators obviously then you know are coaches on the weekend they're at night time so but um, yeah, no, excellent questions. Uh, again, yeah, mining's very typical of this as well. You know, when you're using specialty equipment, um, that forklifts and things like that as well. So look, I'm just conscious of the time. I think we booked this for 45 minutes. I have noticed a few other questions, is, but what we might do is we'll come back to you um, with the responses uh, directly on those. So we've got your details and we'll definitely uh, get back to you on those questions. But thank you, thank you very much for all the questions. Thanks for your time. Um, I know it's precious and uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, if you'd like to speak to one of the access payroll specialists, look, it's as simple as just put it into the chat, say, you know, please contact me and, and you know, we'll have somebody reach out to you, you know, um, directly. Uh, you will see some comms come out post this event possibly the next day or so, uh, you'll get the recording so you can share that with anyone. Um, the slides will come through, so we'll PDF those up so you can reference those slides. And then other resources. So we have a resource library. Now we have more than just what we talk about as far as product. There's a lot of things that can help you around legislative changes. So we do lots of blogs and things like that. So conscious of what the APA do, we try to ladder into some of that work uh, from a consultative perspective. Information is power as they say so um you can also catch our monthly webinars so we've got one coming up in november the 23rd a similar sort of style uh anthony and i host so we bring a topic each month um uh on that one so please um you know we'll, we'll send out details on that as well okay conscious of time so just wanted to you know thank my colleagues as i call them the a team that's that's my saying because i think they're the best but uh, of course we do work with the other a team which starts with A, and that's the APA. So um, I might just pass it back to you, Ross, just to do a close off. Thank you. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you for to the Access Group for the time um, this afternoon. And thank you again for all the members who have logged into this session. I hope you found it informative and insightful, and it was a good learning experience. We will be having another one of these sessions in the month of November, and that will be advertised in the members' monthly update, which comes out on the first Thursday every month so um, look out for that but um, again thank you to the access group and thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon take care thank you so much